Thank you, Jeff, for troubleshooting. Yeah. And uh, I think we're ready to to dive in. So where would you like to start, Ashley, with um, some of your comments or questions that you jotted down in Amos and Hosea things? Want to get us going, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so I guess, so chapter two of um, Amos, uh -huh. actually, Amos and Hosea. Um, so he's talking about, like, when he talks about his judgment on Israel, like, he's speaking of their earthly destruction, but is this also, like, a foreshadowing to, like, Judgment Day? Or is this No, this is in Amos chapter 2 about Israel. That's, remember, he's circling in on the northern half, and Judah is the south, and Israel is the north, and it's specific to the northern kingdom's unfaithfulness and God's judgment actually and historically and reality and physically coming on Israel. There's no big spiritual picture okay. of something else or Judgment Day. There are Judgment Day overtones in some of these prophets' messages like we saw in Joel, but this is just uh, more specific to what's going to happen to the Northern Kingdom. <laughs> okay. It's pretty, pretty amazing and specific. You made the Nazarene, you know, he's accusing them. You made the Nazarites drink wine and commend the prophets not to prophesy. I know, I wrote down there, I said, did they really force Nazarites to drink <laughs> and prophets not to prophesy? Like Probably so. Okay. Yeah, remember Nazarites with a Nazirite, right? They're, yeah. With the, don't touch the dead bodies, nothing to do with grapes. And, yeah. And uh, no razors. No grapes, no razors, no dead bodies. Yeah. So to have them, any grape product, raisins or grape juice or wine, and then, but to force them to drink wine is to make them break their vow. Yeah. <laughs> and tell the prophets not, it's like uh, Amos himself experienced that. Yeah. You know, get out of here, go back to the south. Yeah. Um, and then I had in chapter 3, verse 1, mm -hmm. so then he's saying, um, he was saying against the whole family and he's talking about, so he's, is this all of Israel, like both north and south at this time then? Yeah, he, yeah, but this is, it's mostly the north. Okay. That whole family is, you know, they're, they're certainly part of that. And, and what, what is being said to the north can be said and applied to the south eventually, but the target mostly is the north. Okay. Because the references to the whole nation, you know, they had been part of it but before the Civil War. They're still part of that whole nation, right? Uh -huh. Just as Judah could claim, we're part of the whole nation. So the, the statements I brought you out of Egypt is referring to the whole nation, of course. And, you know, you have I chosen out of all the families of the earth. But you, as, what do you get the verse? Five, proclaim the fort to the fortresses of Ashdod and the fort of Egypt. Assemble yourselves in the mountains of Samaria. See the great run unrest within her. So other nations are, just watch what's going to happen. You know, they're going to be the witnesses of what's going to happen. Samaria is the capital of the north. Okay. In those days, Samaria would be the name of the city. That's the cap, like Jerusalem is the capital of the south. And Samaria is the capital. But later on, after the north is gone, 150 years later, after the south is gone, and then they come back, then remnants of the Israelites who were deported or killed had intermarried with natives and created the Samaritans because they're living in that middle part around the north capital. And so that capital city's name gets applied to the people and the territory. So in Jesus' day, you had, you know, 500 years later, you have Samaritans in the territory of Samaria, but it was it was originally just the capital of the north. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, in G that, that sets the stage because then when Jesus, in the beginning of his ministry, is traveling from where he started. He's baptized in the Jordan River down south, and he calls some disciples. We'll focus on that in worship coming up this Sunday. But then he's, instead of taking the normal route where you, on a map, you know, you cut a 
from from that area across the Jordan to the east side. You go up, and then you go back across the Jordan to to Galilee. He he decides to travel through the middle of the land, which is going to be the higher ground and hillier. But he's going to go right through Samaria. That's very unusual. The Jewish people would avoid that yeah. and go around it. But he's going to go, and that's when he intersects with this woman at the well at Sychar and has that conversation with the woman, the Samaritan woman. But she would be part of this, descended from this group of people who occupied the middle part of the land. Okay. Where the northern tribes had their capital originally, centuries before. That's good. Well, keep going. Um, <laughs> chapter four, I just wrote that this is a, um, this chapter is a good example of, I mean, how we can be stubborn, like, <laughs> I, like a good example for us, like how we can be stubborn too, and like oh boy. trying to fix our own issue, like without <laughs> turning you to know. God for help. I just thought, like, reading. Oh that, like, goodness, you got that right. I noted here in my Bible too about their stubbornness, and you really picked up on that. And, you know, it's it's uh, pretty insulting because he starts off lambasting even the women of the northern kingdom. Did you notice that in chapter four? <laughs> it's well, yeah, I mean, I see, yeah, I see really, it. really insulting. He calls them cows. Yeah, <laughs> you cows of Bashan, you women who oppress the poor. It's just, whoa, whoa man. <laughs> that would you know think that they would really get whacked on the side of the head with this. Um, and then the next thing, this was actually like a question I had that was I was like I couldn't I paged back, but mm -hmm. chapter five verse um, twenty one, when it's saying I hate I despise your religious festivals your assemble assemblies mm -hmm. are stench to me. So he's just talking about, I mean, he's basically saying, like, this is worship without anything, like, any faith, right? Like, it's just kind of right. going through the motions. Exactly. And I was trying to figure out, I know we had talked about this uh, as different time. Mm -hmm. There was a, and I'm, I was just saying, like, this seems really similar to, and I couldn't remember when it was, <laughs> like, was it Nehemiah? But um, I, like, looked back in the notebook, but I couldn't find it. But I don't know when it what time it was that when we were talking about that they're they were going through the motions and yeah yeah I feel like there was a different part of yeah Old Testament that we had read that was like it kind of referenced that I'm sure there's multiple places yeah. of that because that was a that was a problem that came up again and again in their life and I'm trying to think back to when we would have intersected with that thought because I do remember we were talking in a roadmaps class about um, their ritual practices that were hollowed out. You yeah. know, God wants them to do this sacrificial system that he set up with them at Mount Sinai, but when their heart is not in it and they didn't understand the, or appreciate the meaning, just yeah. going through the motions of this. Because I was thinking, is it at the end of Nehemiah that it's like, um, they're weeping because the of like the t I don't know if they're weeping because of the time lost or like there was a there was a section I think it was in Ezra wasn't it where when they were having when Ezra was reading the scriptures and they're hearing it and you know they're getting cut to the heart and uh, the tears are flowing now is that or is it in Nehemiah when Ezra is doing the reading that's what I'm thinking of right that let me just see what's here in the marriage yeah. In Nehemiah, and then Ezra stands up. It's in chapter 8. You're right. It's in Nehemiah. And, you know, he's reading those scriptures, and it's being translated from the Hebrew into the language they could understand, the dialect of Aramaic or whatever. And uh, that's in, like, chapter 8, verse 9, that Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, we're instructing this is sacred, don't warp, mourn or weep. So because in that that's the section where the people were listening to the word of God and they're going, Oh man, we've sinned. Yeah. Because that this is taking place like Amos, this is this is after 
This is after Amos okay. and Hosea. Yeah. This is a couple hundred years later, and you still got the same problem, you know? Yeah. Because they had not yet, with Amos and Hosea, they had not had the northern kingdom destroyed, nor has the southern kingdom gone into being deported to Babylon. And then after that, they're coming back, and now you got some of the same problems. For the, all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. <laughs> you know, they, so these problems recur. Yeah. <laughs> sadly. I just think it's always amazing, at least it is to me, the more I spend time in the Old Testament, that God still hung in there with this nation. Yeah. And brought the Savior to the world through them when, you know, he should have just said, I'm starting over, or, you know. But he had made the commitment and the promise, the Savior will come from that nation. Yeah. And the Savior did. God kept the promise. It's wow. I know. Going, jumping forward, I guess, like in Hosea, well, I guess that's backwards. <laughs> um, there was chapter 11 at the beginning. I read that, and I just thought it was so, it was, like, I got almost emotional reading it. Like, it's so convicting, and oh. I just think, yeah. like, it, it makes God, it just feels like God's sadness is so personal to <laughs> her yeah. sin. Yeah. Like when he says, especially when he's like, what does he say? To them, I was like the one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them, feed them, and just I don't know the the examples to me. Are, it's just it's such a yeah. it's a personal. What verse were you looking at there? I mean, I guess I was looking at like one through four. Yeah. When he starts. This was the child I loved him out of Egypt. I called my son. The more I called Israel, the further they went away from me. Yeah. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they didn't realize it was I who healed them. I'm not sure how your translation reads. There. Yeah, I have an NIV tonight. Yeah. But I just, all of that really, it really hit me. And then yeah. going further in verse 8, um, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I give you up over Israel? Oh my. And it just seems like I don't. It's just such a good example of like how strong God's love is. Like oh. even now, I feel like I'm getting emotional talking about. It. <laughs> that's really beautiful. It really is, because that, that isn't that what the Holy Scriptures do, and it's very pointed here. You know, we yeah. can see the heart of God. You know, and He's rightly angry. You know, but then He still is the God of compassion and love, and that's how He deals with me. And with you, you know, that's, yeah. I certainly don't deserve it. But he still treats us as his dearly loved children, even though we don't deserve it. Yeah. And uh, so that that's one of the surprising things in rereading Hosea, rereading Amos. You know, you get these powerful message of God's judgment, and we use the technical term law, but then always wedged in there, you know, there'll be these gospel gems, these little glimpses of his love and promise. And it's just, it's striking in, yeah. by way of contrast when you come across that. Yeah. That's an, I, I don't know if you caught that though too, in the beginning, now that you took us to Hosea 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Which historically we know happened, right? But what I find interesting is that this. Hosea statement, which probably people listening to him wouldn't have caught, but later on in scripture, it's quoted as a prediction of what would happen to his actual son, the son of God. Remember the story of Herod attacking uh, and killing the babies of Bethlehem, and the angel warns Joseph and he takes the family to Egypt. And then this passage is quoted. When they come back, out of Egypt I've called my son. This is actually a mess messianic prophecy prediction. This is quoted in Matthew chapter 2. Okay, because I saw the New Testament references there. And I, was like, <laughs> I don't know what the <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah if you take a look at uh, Matthew, we can open our Bibles. We've got a chance to do that. And you go to chapter 2. So, 
you know, the escape to Egypt when the angel is gone in verse 13. The Lord appears to Joseph, get up and take your child to Egypt. So verse 14, he took the child and his mother during the night and set out to Egypt. There he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I've called my son. So in the most unsuspecting way, and you're reading Hosea, where you have God in his love explaining that he really has this heart of love for these wayward Israelites. They were unfaithful. He remains faithful. And he makes that statement, which is true, that they became this nation and he took them out of Egypt. But it's also at the same time a prediction of what would happen for the Son of God who took on human flesh. And it's quoted in the New Testament that way, which is, wow. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And again, you know, it's one of those things, too, where you have all these Old Testament predictions about the Savior and what would happen in such great detail, which adds to our understanding and our confidence in the verbal doctrine of verbal inspiration. The Bible's really God-breathed all true cover to cover. I mean, what other book would have such a thing where you'd have such details that fit perfectly? Everything from they won't break his bones and they'll shake dice for his clothes, you know, and then this line out of Egypt, I've called myself. Well, that actually happened. <laughs> so it just adds to the veracity of the truthfulness of Scripture for us when predictions are made and fulfilled. I'm trying to think of other places where God refers to Israel as his son. Because hmm. that, that does seem unique. I'd have to give myself a little bit of time to think about that one. Um, his child, his son. You don't happen to have anything written in the side here from your your Bible or anything. Huh? That one I'd have to think about and maybe jot down and look up. Are there other places? I, I, I mean, I would certainly agree. It's the, it's the uh, it's the reference back to the exodus from Egypt and it's the mm -hmm. prophecy to Jesus going to Egypt. But, but that um, the nation would be identified by God as his yeah. son or it child. Just struck me as unique yeah. you know, as we were talking about it. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm going to have to jot that one down or keep in my memory banks and think about that. Would there be other prophets that would use that same language? Or did God speak that way in other passages? I don't know. I have an answer for you, Jeff, that I can think of right off the top of my head. I guess I had a question just about maybe the, sure. um, just the outline, I guess, of Hosea. Um, it's a difficult book to outline. Yeah, because like in chapter 2, it's like punish Israel punished and restored but then you know starting in verse 4 it goes on to like be all the charges against yeah. Israel so I guess I just was confused like the order of how things I don't yeah know. It, you know in my notebook though I think this, this is just a suggestion that I had in one way to look at Hosea so in chapter 1 through the beginning of 2 living in the Lord's family that's where we're introduced to these characters that you know Hosea is to marry this prostitute now it's likely that he did that and it could be that she brought a child into the marriage even though it says she conceived and bore him a son she might that might be a reference to she already had a son okay. that is considered to be Jose's, but then they marry and they have other children. Okay. But that's one chunk. And then I have in my notes that in chapter 2, going up to verse 13, here we have, you know, look at the Lord's anger. And then there's these abrupt shifts. So at verse 14, I'll look at the Lord's love. You know, this is it's law and gospel is what we have in chapter 2. But verse 14 is where the shift comes in, and all of a sudden there's good news. And that is very much like almost all of 
Amos, which is like eight and a half chapters, and in the middle of chapter nine, right at the end of the book, all of a sudden it's gospel. Here in Hosea, it goes from one to the other, and it's like when you're going to be reading Isaiah. Now that's a big task for us in the coming week. Mm -hmm. But the first half of the book is primarily God's condemning judgment, and the second half is all this glorious promises. But in the middle of all the judgment and condemnation of the first half of the book of Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39, you get passages like, uh, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. You get, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. You know, that's chapter 9. You know, so, and then, you know, the, the, the stem of, the shoot of Jesse comes out of the dry stuff, chapter 11. So even in the Isaiah's uh, law part of the preaching, there's gospel gems that get in there, and Hosea has that too. Right in chapter 2, when you get all this really description of, whoa, what he's going to be doing to them, then all of a sudden, verse 14, I'm going to allure, I will, you know, I'll woo her back. I'll give her back her vineyards. In that day, you will call me my husband, and I'll no longer, you'll no longer call me master. And then it shifts again. So in chapter, that takes a us into chapter 3, but once you get a little farther into chapter 4, now we're going to have his charges against them, and he brings charges about their uh, lack of knowledge and their lack of love. <laughs> I'm not sure that answered completely, Ashley, what you were thinking about, but there is both law and gospel yeah. as the prophet is proclaiming the message of God. I have a question on one of your questions. Oh, okay. Uh, question number eight. It's uh, 121 in the old, so I think that would make it 125 in the new? Yeah. Yeah. Note the possible explanations. Yeah, yeah I guess I always thought this was, this was literal. I think so, too. But there are other, you know, over time in history, people have had other suppositions about what this might be. So these are possible. This was a non-practicing harlot, or this was a woman who became a harlot later, or this is just symbolism, or this is really literal history. I would lean toward the fourth bullet point, because mm -hmm. I do believe that's exactly what happened, that God had Hosea do this. But we have to grant that there are other people who looked at this and maybe have other explanations and I think that if you tend lean toward the others, you're sort of downplaying the reality of the picture and not making it as intense. That's why I lean to the fourth bullet point as being the one that I think is the best reading of it, best understanding of it. And I, I, that comes from a little bit of you know your own personal experience maybe in life right when you it's it's always our tendency as human beings to maybe if we're going to announce God's judgment and his law to to smooth it out a little bit or make it not as sound as as bad as it really is God's anger which it it's sort of like the line um, you know God God uh, hates the sin but loves the sinner That just sounds so nice in our ears. Hate the sin, but loves the sinner. And I can understand that. But in reality, he not only hates the sin, he also hates the sinner. I mean, that's really the... And he's, what, what? But that's how pointed and how uh, powerful and strong and real God's holy law is. It is designed actually to kill us. That's New Testament terminology from the Apostle Paul. Um, the letter kills, the spirit gives life. So, and that, what, if we're doing it as Christians, or maybe even as pastors who are preaching or teaching, 
if we do it right, we convict ourselves and our listeners, and with the with the sword, we you know we stick it in. It's just, it hurts, but then it's necessary because you can't really appreciate, you know, like your reaction when you're reading this beautiful stuff about God's love in spite of unfaithfulness. You can't really appreciate that unless you really know how much you need it. Just really the whole point of law and gospel and scripture. Shows us how desperately we need Christ. Exactly. It's on our own we're And I I just, you know, personal opinion, but you know, there are a lot of people in our American society who are doing well, and mostly I mean by that, you know, economically, at least on the surface. They got a nice job, they got a nice house, they got a retirement plan. They don't like COVID, they don't like politics that are going on and they're disgusted, but by and large, you know, we're not suffering. They got, put their mask on, go to the grocery store, and ooh, we're all upset that in the first week of COVID you couldn't get toilet paper, you know. Ooh, <laughs> or they were running low on potatoes or onion, because everybody's, or flour, because everybody's baking bread at home, you know. Ooh, what a hardship we had, right? Yeah. But I don't know too many people, I don't know about you, who actually ran out and had nothing to use, no toilet paper. You know what I mean? I just, I don't know. And I think about stories of, um, it just wasn't available like it is even in a pandemic. When, when my parents would talk about stories about the German ranch, German Russian ranchers out in South Dakota, and there's no plumbing. There was no plumbing in their parsonage when they were, he's the pastor. And, you use the outhouse. But that's why they always appreciated the Sears and Roebuck catalog being mailed, the big catalog. Because they, they would tear out sheets and use that for toilet paper. And that's, it's gross. I'm sorry to read them. But we don't, you know, that was, but that's, uh, and, and we, but we live in our, you know, now 2021, but 2020 with a, ooh, a toilet paper shirt, or, you know, flour. Well, People have it so good, right, that even hardship really isn't hardship. And, and you know, they, and so there's a lot of people who, what do I need God? Why do I need a savior? Why do I, my life is fine. I just, okay, I had furlough a little bit for work and maybe I lost it, I'll, I'll get a job. And if I don't get a job, I'll get, I'll get unemployment checks and I'll get, you know, I'll, I'll be fine and there's, Nobody's really desperate <laughs> for physical things, right? And I think that puts people in a mode where they're not really desperate for any spiritual things. Now, by contrast, of course, those who really pay attention to the Holy Bible, you can have a ton of dough or you can have none, but that it's striking how bad our sinfulness really is. And when you grasp it, you know how desperately you need Jesus. And uh, that's really the point of Hosea and Amos. <laughs> any other ones that we could see? Maybe even in my little list here. Would you have any problems? I don't know if you had time sometimes in reading to get at some of these to see if you had any questions about them. So I can run through some of these if you don't mind on page 124, which is 120 in the old notebook, right? Describe the lifestyle of the Northern Kingdom. Well, I think we did that when we introduced. You know, they're doing fairly well, actually. Rather prosperous in their lifestyles. And they had the blessing of God, and yet they did the calf worship and fell away. And, of course, uh, what made Amos' ministry difficult was to leave his farm in the south and go up to speak to people with stern law and their hard-heartedness. Uh, maybe number four, the root sin of Israel. Did you pick up on that in Amos chapter 5? Verse 5. The root sin in the northern kingdom Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba, for Gilgal will surely go in exile in Bethel. That's uh, 
Bethel and Gilgal were sites for mixed worship. So yeah, the king had set up, we could say calf worship, but you know, yeah, there's some idols involved, but this is not yet rank paganism. It's like what King Ahab and his wife Jezebel introduced, which is the Baal worship of the native peoples. But the calf worship is what I often refer to as mixed worship. So you got the true God plus. And in any way, shape, or form, you take the true God and the message of his love alone and mix it with something that humans do. Now we have the basis for what led to the Martin Luther's angst and uh, concern and then the Reformation. <laughs> Once God doesn't do it all and we do something to add to it, now we have a problem. And that's, I don't know, it's, I think it's harder for people who have a Christian background where it's mixed worship, where you have, okay, Jesus did a whole lot of good things, but I do some stuff too. It's sometimes harder to sort that out and help people uh, drop their mixed thinking about God plus me than it is for somebody who's completely clean slate, raw, <laughs> and learning about Jesus in the first place. That was at the root of the problems up north. Well, we don't have to run through all of these here, so. What was Bethel originally, though? Trying to, was that from? House of God, Beth Ale, Beth, yeah. Beth, B E T H, is oh, Hebrew that? for house, and Ale is God. And remember the Jacob story? Yeah, I was trying to think. That's of, that's okay. the one. Yeah, Jacob was that, running from Esau, right? And he's going north, and then he's you know fifty miles north, and he's pooped, and he stops at this beneath the rock for his pill. Right, he has the dream, angels up and down, and God, you know, right? And the God promises. You're leaving, but I'll be with you, and I'll bring you back. This is the house of God, Beth Ale, and that's the site. That's the site that was used um, by the king of the north, and it's just across the border from the south. It's a few miles, you know, you get Jerusalem, and you're right up on the edge of the southern kingdom, and now you go a few miles north, and then you get Bethel, you know, maybe 10 or so. So it's not like he's setting up his, his uh, mixed worship in the middle of the northern kingdom. He put it, the first part of it, the initial start of it, is at Bethel. So that when people from the north, who typically were supposed to, at least for the big three festivals, two in the spring and one in the fall, go to Jerusalem, well, you're on that road anyway, and you're, but you, you don't go all the way you stop. You don't get to Milwaukee. You stop, you know, at, you know, you stop at Menominee Falls, and <laughs> it's just, you don't get all the way. You know, you just, you got to come to, you know, it's that's far enough if you're coming from, from Appleton or Wausau or whatever. You wanna, you wanna get to Milwaukee, right downtown. You wanna, no, you you get as far as Milwaukee. That's good enough, and then we'll set up. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not a good analogy. People in Menominee Falls get mad at me for saying it's not good enough. <laughs> we love Menominee Falls. <laughs> that was a that was a good one. What else can you think of that you'd like in these unique books of Hosea? Passionate. I'm glad you picked up on that. Ashley, about the passion that the Lord expresses in Hosea. It really is a very powerfully tender, like the heart of God opening up, you know. But I just think that the astounding conclusion to Amos is one of those things that you just marvel at after all that harsh judgment and visions of judgment when you're in chapter 9 at the end of Amos. I don't know if you'd like to turn there. It's just so striking. 
He had just said in verses 9 and 10, I will give the command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations as grain is shaken in a sieve, and, but not a kernel will fall the ground. All the sinners among my people will die by the sword. All those who say disaster will not overtake it. Guess what? It's coming. But then, in that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I'll repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. Days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter, by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mouth. So, I don't know if you catch how beautiful that is, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman. You know, normally you're going to reap grain in that seven-week frame from Passover to Pentecost. We're kind of in the month of, you know, end of April into May. There's seven weeks, roughly speaking, because, you know, it takes a while to plant by hand and it takes a while for grain and won't all. Like nowadays we look at a farmer's field and all the corn grows about the same time and gets all harvested within a couple of days. This takes weeks because it took weeks to plant. And, but there is, what he's saying is my blessing is going to be so abundant that the reapers who are bringing in the grain and usually are done in a, that seven week span, they're still going to be reaping grain by next November when it's time to plow again. There's going to be so much. That's incredible picture right there of the overwhelming blessing of God and the planter by the one treading grapes. So you, you pick the grapes in September and October and then you're going to be squishing grapes in order to get the grape juice and stuff. But the planting doesn't start until like November, December. <laughs> and, and they're still going to be <laughs> working on the grapes because there's so many grapes. And that's the picture that he's giving us here. Such blessing God will bring. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I'll bring back my exiled people, Israel. They haven't even gone into exile yet. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I've given them. So now we have not only a prediction that, yes, there's going to be exile and return, but now we're looking beyond that to the spiritual kingdom of the New Testament church, never to be uprooted. So persecution can come and viruses and pandemics can come and anything else can happen but heaven and earth will pass away Jesus said my word will never pass away so he's, he's a promise here that his church that's us the believers even though we physically that we live forever we live on earth we live for that never ever go away that's always going to be God's family of believers his church it's just a beautiful thing in end of Amos here. How do you know that that refers to the New Testament church and not to heaven? It's both. Okay. Yeah, it's both. New Testament church and heaven are all one. You know, they're all picture the same because covered by the Jesus' righteousness and blood forgiving us, when God looks at us, we already are perfect. We already are declared innocent, which is what we will be in heaven. We don't enjoy it completely. We have it. We enjoy it now. We don't enjoy it fully right now. But we already are. You know, when does, it's another question like that. When does your eternal life begin? Well, it began when you're baptized, right? Now you're not fully enjoying it because you've got your sinful nature and you've got everything else around you. In heaven you will. But this is all one. It's just one seamless, you know, we have our physical life and connection to God spiritually, and we go right to heaven. There's, for our soul, we're already in heaven. I mean, that's the, that's the astounding thing. So this is, physical death is just, that's not really an interruption in our life with God. <laughs> and that's why um, I think that might come up, it might come up in the Bible study for the church council that's coming up on Monday again. But that's what Jesus refers to death as a sleep. And then Paul picks up on that in his letter to the Thessalonians too. Well, it, 
it is asleep. You know, because when you fall asleep, you get rest from all the troubles. And theoretically, if you're not, if you've got insomnia and you got other problems, you might. But you know, the idea is you get physical physical sleep. You're resting from all the woes and all the problems, and all the troubles. So that's one thing that sleep does. It gives you a break from all the hassle around you. It also does not mean, though, when you're sleeping, that that's the end of your existence. Sleep is not the end. It's just it, you're still alive and you're still... And the same thing with death. Death is a break from all of the earthly woes and problems and troubles, but death does not end our existence. So just like sleep, death gives us a break and death does not end our existence. We just, we're, we're still living when we physically die. Our souls are still living. There's no break. There's no, not even a pause. It's not even like, well, I gotta wait about 10 minutes before I start enjoying, you know, or a half a day and I'll, my soul will get me. The moment we die, today you'll be with me in paradise, he said to the dying thief on the cross, right? Not like, well, about 2 a.m. you're gonna, you know, to be in paradise or tomorrow or something. No. Now, when you get to the end of the line, <laughs> and that you know that's right, and that's like uh, like the apostle Paul says in the end of chapter fifteen of First Corinthians into sixteen. He goes into sixteen. He says, "Now is the day of salvation." That, it's now, and it's hard for us sometimes to see that, and because we we live in the theology of the cross. We live under the cross. We have these woes and troubles and problems for a reason. But uh, that's the beauty of Amos, too. It's, there is this prediction of the New Testament church which goes on into eternity. That's just really cool. Um, I guess I have, this isn't like exactly on the reading, but just yeah. with like the Old Testament prophecies and then them being fulfilled, like mm -hmm. I guess like modern day Jews like Jewish people, do they not, do they include everything that we include in the Old Testament? Like That, that is really a good question, and I, I would have to have more conversations with more Jewish people. I've had uh, that, and, and today, interestingly enough, I went to go where I work out, and there was a guy, as I'm coming toward the locker room area, who was standing next to a locker and on his phone and talking quite loudly and mentioning to whoever's on the phone, well, check, check with the aunt, check with the aunt. She's my aunt, and I think yours too, if you look back in there. But if you look at the family line of the Crawfords, they're all Levites. My father told me that, you know, my grandfather was a Levite, and we were, you know, he was going on to some heritage thing about, this is a big deal that you're in this. He was obviously talking about the Jewish nation. And I thought to myself, how interesting because they're tied to any kind of hope of if there is such a thing as eternal happiness it has to do with the bloodline connection. It's physical. You better have the right DNA. Could there be converts of Judaism? Of course, but that's, that's a big deal. So um, most Jew Jewish, the Jewish perspective that we see today was shaped after, during and after the Babylonian captivity, 500 years before Christ, six to five to 600 years before. That drove them to monotheism, which is good, get rid of idols, but they went overboard and lost the doctrine of the Trinity. It also began their understanding that we are under pressure from another world power. The Assyrians damaged most of our nation, but the Babylonians did it. They did it. So now from them we go 100 years under there. Now we go to the Persians. And after the Persians, then we have the Greeks. And after the Greeks, we have the Romans. They're always oppressed. Always oppressed. Always oppressed. For 500 or 600 years. And they just want out from under that. They want God desperately to send the Messiah. They know that he's predicted that a Messiah will come from their nation. And they want that, and they just, it's really hard for us to grasp, but they just, it was just 
drilled into their being and their psyche among their conversations and how they lived that we desperately need a, a, a Messiah so that we can be physically free of oppression. And this business of a Savior coming to point out how sinful we are and that we need him to forgive our sins and then we're going to be close to God, that was so far removed from their thought pattern. That's not it. Why would we need a Savior from sin when we're, we have the right DNA? We're in the right nation. We're, we're, we're the chosen ones. Of course, if you're in the right DNA, we're going to have to save or come and free us up. Well, once Jesus comes on the scene and points out what he really came for, which all the prophets predicted, they're not paying attention to the scriptures. They just didn't. Jesus even told them, you diligently search the scriptures. And they did. Many of their scribes and everything else. But you're not seeing what's really there. You search the scriptures, but they testify about me. No, they, no, they don't. <laughs> we don't see you here. You know? <laughs> they just. And then you have the sad fact that the teachings developed by the rabbis are commentaries on Old Testament rules and regulations because you have at the, at the root of all this business of their disconnect from God and the truth of scripture is twofold. It's political and physical, this earth, our life, and the political pressure. And it's also the part of the inborn sinful nature that we all have. It started with Adam and Eve. And what is that? The Latin phrase is opinio legis. It's the, the natural understanding opinion of our inborn, our inborn sense, our sinful nature says, I'm all right, I don't need God. And if I can get some help from God, or if there is one, that'd be fine. But whatever I'm going to have for a better life now or for it, I have to. Have, I'm going to do it. I'll at least contribute. I'll, I'll have. I have some stake in this. My action, my decision, my feelings, my choice, my me, 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 I. The the sinful nature is turned inward on itself. That's 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 what we inherited from Adam and Eve. That sinful nature, inborn. See, a lot of people have asked me, how how can Somebody Roman Catholic believes in work righteousness. You have to earn your way to heaven. How can they believe when the Bible is so clear? Well, it's normal. The shock is the miracle that you don't believe that, neither do I. That's the shock. Because if you believe that you can't match up to God's standards, that they're too high, then a miracle happened because God the Spirit worked on your heart to convince you that the God's law is true. And if you believe that your only hope is through Jesus alone, not you, that's a miracle of the Spirit working faith in your heart. Because it's normal, natural, and predictable that we're going to think, well, I, I'm okay. Okay, I need a little help. God can do that, a little help on that. But basically, I'm me. I, you take that inborn sinful nature and you match it with this political pressure that they've been under for centuries. And now you get Judaism that is saying, okay, God, send a Messiah, but be a political king, and if you're not going to do that, we'll be okay, because we'll figure it out on our own, because we are who we are, after all, with the right DNA. <laughs> so then they reject Jesus and kill him, because he's looking him in the eye and saying, you're going to burn in hell without me. What? You know, like this. And they get rid of him, they think. But then that, that spreads. Their Judaism is scattered after Roman persecution, and Christianity spread too. But then Judaism, you know, finds its way into Europe, and and it's it's there along with Christianity. But they are not interested in, in fact, less and less and less in what the Old Testament scriptures really have to say. Those who are their spiritual leaders, the rabbis, the teachers, are going to be more interested in the sermons and the explanations of the rabbis of centuries ago based on their Old Testament laws and other laws they had. That's called the Talmud. The Talmud was developed as, you know, a couple of centuries after Christ as a gathering of the sermons and commentaries of, of famous 
rabbi teach, rabbis are teachers. And there's volumes. And if you want to know what Judaism is, you don't look to the Old Testament scriptures, you look to the Talmud. The Talmud tells you what Judaism is like. If you want to study what Judaism is like, that's it. Not the scriptures. And uh, then, then, then you have the, then you've got to go centuries down the road, and then you have this phenomenon called America, and it's right. And then eventually, Europe things happen that are from every from political problems and wars and famine, and so people come in boats to this new world. And what's different about this is that in this new world experience, you don't have state or government controlled religion. And in, in some circles in Europe, you know, the, the Jewish people were persecuted and they lived in ghettos. Now, you know, a lot of people don't realize that when you use the word, you know, Jewish ghetto, we, we, we think about American society and ghettos as being all poverty and low income and broken home. But the, the Jewish ghettos were actually where all the bankers lived and all their, you know, that's where all the money was. And... Um, it was one of the prime motivators why Hitler did what he did. He wanted their money. And, you know, it's, it's you know, genocide and it's bigotry, you know, that through the Holocaust. It was all sinful and wrong. But the motivating factor, which is put out there in the propaganda that they're a lower race, is not as much really a motivating factor. He wanted their money. They had all the art, they had all the gold, they had all the, they had all the banking, they controlled all that. And he wanted his hands on that. <laughs> Which is pathetic, but that's really what... Well, when you come to America, though, then Judaism take, starts taking on its distinct flavors, usually in three tracks. You have the Orthodox, which are, like, straight, and they're really going to follow the Talmud in detail. And there are even subsets of the Orthodox that are the Hasidim with the curly sideburns and the hats and the long beards, and and they, you know, that they're extremely detailed about following Talmudic law and codes. And then you have conservative Jews, which are really moderates, and they'll do the festivals and they'll do the, you know, they'll observe Hanukkah, Yom Kippur. Passover, but it's, it's mostly their nation. Their, they feel this tie to their culture, and then there are Reformed Jews who are happy to say that they have this cultural background. But some of them will even eat ham, you know. So it's not Jewish, you know. So, so what what is it that they pin their hopes on? Well. When I had had conversations, and it's not a lot, but it's a Jewish person I spent some time with years ago, you know, they, they really don't know the Old Testament. And now those who are more strict will will have their children go through their, you know, their catechism stuff is their bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah. Bar is son and bat is daughter. And it's son of the commandment, daughter of the commandment, mitzvah, daughter of the commandment. And they're to study in Hebrew the Old Testament first five books, the Torah. And, you know, all well and good, but it's, it's more of a cultural thing. Because you still have, based in Judaism, this, we are oppressed, we need to have our independence, and we have a sinful nature that's guiding our all, you know, what, what do we have? Is there a heaven? Well, eh, yeah, heaven, but at least it make your life better. Now, and it's up to you. And every world religion is basically, it's up to you. It's true for Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and Taoism and Mormonism and they're, you know, they're, Christianity is the only one that says, no, you can't do it. God has to do it all, and he did. So I'm not sure I really answered your questions because, you know, they're, <laughs> No, I mean, you, you definitely did. There's, <laughs> Too long a story, but you know it's it's just it's sad, and you, when you it, it takes when you understand and know a little bit about that history and watch, you know, twenty centuries go by from the time of Christ and the buildup with the Jewish people in the five hundred years before. You watch all that unfold, 
And then you read Paul in his letter to the Romans in chapters 9, 10, and 11, how he's just weeping that his fellow Jewish people would, he just prays to God, that they would come to trust in Jesus and, and be, you know, because they, they're part of the original vine, you know, and we Gentiles are just grafted in to God's tree. And they're the original ones, but they're the ones who are dying off and get pruned, you know, if only. And he says, you know, eventually what God will do is, under his blessing, some will come to faith, but then all Israel will be saved in Romans chapter 11. What he means is all Israel is, this, is the sense of all believers. You and I are the true Israel, believers in Jesus. And he says that in his letters. So, and it's just interesting to me that because that's what makes Old Testament study so, because what we're trying to do when we walk through the Old Testament, we want to see Jesus again and again and again, because that's really what it is. It's God and his undeserved love towards sinners that he saves us by his grace alone and not our doing. And that's the message that comes through. And if you study it and read it, that's why Jesus said, you, you got the scriptures, you sir? This is about me. <laughs> you know, and uh, that's what we want to see. I just love the Old Testament because it's so rich. But, you know. Although I'm glad I'm living in the New Testament era. <laughs> I think we got a better perspective, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, how about this? Let's let's introduce uh, Micah and Isaiah. This recording can go on, and our dear friends at home. Do we able to communicate? That sorry about our net lack of streaming. Or? Yeah, they're they're all understanding, but <laughs> yeah, it's frustrating. Our apologies. I did apologize. Yeah. Appreciate that. So we covered all these questions that I wanted to talk about, and uh, I'm going to move ahead here to here. Reap the whirlwind, right? That's my name. So here's Isaiah. He is the author, and he wrote over a long span of ministry from 750 to 680 BC. And where is he? Very likely in the south in Judah, but Israel's still around. Now, here's the divider line date. If you're jotting that into your notebook or if you had it previously in a notebook, um, and I am on, I'll just page ahead here to make sure we're all together. 28. Okay. Yep. I have, is it 128 or 127? I have one. 20, 20, 27 in the new notebook okay. and 23 in the old. Um, but if you look at the date, 750 to 680, I'll just give you a date that you may or may not recall. But 722 is the Assyrian attack and destruction of the north. So you could see that Isaiah straddles that. His ministry straddles the destruction of the north. So, if you look at my uh, outline on page 127 or old 123, you can see that the first half of the book, which is a message of denunciation, primarily judgment, letters A, B, C, and D, right? Judgment on Judah, Jerusalem. Judgment on foreign nations. Universal judgment. Final judgments. The second half is going to be this message of comfort. I'll talk about that in a minute. But look at that italicized middle part on my outline there. There is a historical interlude that occurs, and it's recorded by Isaiah chapter 36 to 39. And uh, the background for this, if you have your Bibles and can go to Isaiah, you probably shouldn't be plopping things on this table because the microphone's right there. Um, if you go to chapter 36, this is where the historical interlude starts. And it's describing how Sennacherib, king of Assyria, is coming on the attack in Jer at Jerusalem. And we're right around 700 BC. Because the north already is gone. And now he's threatening the south. That's, this is the scary part, right? So the world power, Assyria, is like, uh oh, threatening. And then in chapter 37, we have a prediction of deliverance. 
and eventually Sennacherib falls. And if you're looking with me at chapter 37, verse 36, and it's at the end of that chapter, right? Pretty much. The angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Jerusalem is surrounded by Assyrians. And Hezekiah prays, Dear Lord, deliver us. And God does just that, miraculously. And they wake up the next morning, all the bad guys are dead. Well, how about that? You know, so that so here you have Isaiah with Assyria being a threat coming down from the north, and they wipe out the northern kingdom, and now they're threatening Jerusalem, even surrounding it. But now they're they're off the scene. Well, what happens? You get chapter 38, Hezekiah, there's a description of his illness, but then here's this sad transition, chapter 39 where some representatives from Babylon, of all places, sent letters and a gift. They heard about Hezekiah's illness. Well, what does he do in verse 2? He receives the envoys gladly from Babylon and showed them what was in his storehouses, silver, gold, spices, fine oil, entire army, everything found among his treasure. There was nothing in the palace or all his kingdom that Hezekiah didn't show them, and oops, so this is like this is like President Biden showing somebody from we're worried about Russia or North Korea or you know some other Iran and they're trying to develop nuclear weapons or China and you know you don't want to give away too many secrets these world powers because that'll threaten American security but then Somebody comes from, you know, Madagascar or Sierra Leone or some little country, you know, and and then Biden takes them to Fort Knox and shows them all the gold and takes them around and shows them every, all the riches, and, and and then it turns out that this tiny little country like Honduras or Sierra Leone or Madagascar, you know, they turn out within. 50 years to be a world power with more nuclear arsenals than we have. You wouldn't believe it. If right now, you're saying that a world threat to America would be this little country on the coast of Africa or something like that. You know, but that's that's Hezekiah's view of Babylon. The heads, you know, Assyria, they're the bad guys. Well, God took care of them. And now we've got these little visitors from little Babylon. So you want to see around? I'll show you around. Turns out that became the next world power, and they had the nuclear arsenal that God used to wipe out the sun. So this is what's happening in chapters 36, 37, 38, and 39. There's four chapters of where Isaiah, who's straddling this whole ministry time from 7 to 680, he's right now in the middle, and he's taking us historically from one world power threatening off the scene, now to the next world power. That's the background. Because now we're going to go to chapter 40 to 66, and it comes with this message of comfort, and it's to people who need to know that the Babylonians will not damage you eternally. They're going to be overtaken by Cyrus of Persia, and God is going to rescue you. And, and now, you know, this is 700 B.C., and there's no Babylonians yet. There's no, and Persia is that they don't come on the scene until like 536, you know. So the, nobody really appreciated Isaiah's second half of the book until 150 years later. Then it made sense. And he's writing it poetry so that they can sing it and they can memorize it because you're not going to be able to lug all these scrolls along and they don't have, you know, photocopiers and. They can't photo with their iPhone and take it in their long and they got, you know, they, but it's in their head. And so when they get to Babylon now, and then they're thinking, uh oh, we're going to be stuck here. And then later, when the Persians take over and they're wondering what's going to happen to us, comfort, comfort ye, my people, speak ye. Yeah. <laughs> then you get it, you know, then it all, Isaiah makes sense. So that that's. This is just an unbelievable, this is the gospel in the Old Testament 
uh, that, that, that far surpasses every, you know, this is it. So now you get to the second half of the book, and if you turn the page in your notebook, it is set up in a way, in a literary fashion, that knocks your socks off. It is centering like none other. There's 27 chapters, 13 on each side that build up to the middle, and the middle chapter of the 27, between 40 to 66, is chapter 53, and there you are on Calvary with Jesus. That is the pinnacle of the Old Testament right there. That is the mountaintop. That is it. Isaiah 53. And uh, it's worth, as we're introducing, just to page your Bible open to chapter 53, and I'll show you what I mean. It is the pivotal and middle height. Who's believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a tender shoot. He had no beauty or majesty. Nothing in his appearance that we should do. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of sorrows, really with suffering. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God and smitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He's crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds were healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I mean, that, and then it ends with the resurrection. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, verse 9. Though he had done no violence nor deceit, he had, it was the Lord's will to crush him. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring prolong his days. The will of the Lord, the Lord will prosper in his hand. He'll see the light of life, verse 11. That's the resurrection. So you have the death and resurrection of Jesus in chapter 53. In ways that, you know, we... And then this is the scripture reading that we use on Good Friday. And this is the basis for all that stuff from the uh, George Friedrich Handel's Messiah to the stricken, smitten, and afflicted, see him dying on a tree. You know, that all the hymnody we have, and all the, this is all Isaiah 53. Just, whoa. It's incredible. But pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. And there is that whole doctrine of vicarious atonement, the substitutionary work of our Savior Jesus is right there, clear as a bell. And it, it's just, it's the most beautiful, it just, it puts a lump in your throat, there it is. That's Isaiah. And if you ever would like, besides <laughs> trying to read 66 chapters in a week, I get it, these are huge assignments coming up when we have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. You might not get through all of it, and that, that's okay, but if you wanted to take time and for your own personal devotional life, and just walk through, think through, and ponder Isaiah. I would strongly recommend uh, Professor Pastor John Brown's People's Bible Commentaries on Isaiah. And they're, I believe they come in two volumes. You know the People's Bible set, we have these paperbacks. There's 40-some volumes on the entire 66 books, right? But Isaiah has two volumes. It's, and, and John Brown, B-R-A-U-N, you can get this at nph.net because it's now, we wrote them, but it's now published through Concordia Publishing House, St. Louis, but we still market it through our publishing house. And um, he's got a great, wonderful writing style. And of all the paperbacks, People's Bible series, there are some that really jump out to me. Uh, Daniel by Professor Jeske, and you know, the other ones. But Isaiah by Pastor Brown, that you can just. You can just take your Bible, and of course the NIV uh, 84 version is in that people's Bible itself, but you can take your own Bible and you can read his commentaries and going through and just sense uh, the depth of and the beauty of Isaiah. It really, and you take maybe, you know, a chapter, just a few pages of Brown's commentary and that your devotion for the day, or you could just pause and think about it for a week and then you can go to the next chapter, you know. And you could spend a year just going through Isaiah and reading through the People's Bible Commentary. It's wonderful. It's, it's well, well worth the, uh, they're not that expensive. A great Christmas or birthday gift. And add to your shelf if you don't have them. So shameless advertising, but it's just that good. And uh, let's do Micah, then we'll call it a night, right? So I'm gonna, I think on the PowerPoint, though, I do have some of this stuff. You know, he's on my timeline from back in the page 56. His name, Isaiah, means the Lord is salvation. And so I did talk about the two primary 
uh, historic background of shifting world powers from Assyria, there's the map, you know, and then you go to the commander coming in, and, and he's mentioned in the Bible, Sargon and Sennacherib, they're there. In the scriptures, Sennacherib is mentioned, contemporary with Hezekiah. But uh, this outline now transitions, as I said, chapter 36, 39, to Babylon. And there's the Babylonian Empire, which they, they overtook the Assyrians. And uh, so notice especially the structure of the second half of the book is that centering I just talked about. And that takes us, uh, it's, it's a long read. If you're just going to read through Isaiah, it's almost three hours, two hours and 40 minutes, just slowly reading through. So it's, this is not, but it's gorgeous. And maybe you can save time when you come in the first half to these chapters that repeat condemnation after condemnation to uh, Babylon and all the nations around. Pastor. Let's talk Micah. So Micah is the one who wrote that. We're now on page 129, I think, in the new book, right? Mm -hmm. And he's a contemporary of Isaiah, 740 to 690. I get those numbers by the book starting off mentioning kings. Micah's ministry takes place during the kings, and then they list them. And we know what those kings ruled. So that's where we get these dates. And he is like Isaiah, mostly in the south, but this, the north does exist for a time, until 722. What stands out for me for Micah, which I call a moral madness cause and cure, is is paranomasia. That, and paranomasia, what is that? It's not twins from Hong Kong, uh, but a play on words. And it, it just, unfortunately, you don't get it all completely in English. It's best in Hebrew <laughs> language, and so you're at a bit of a disadvantage. But um, So I want to take you to Micah chapter 1 as an example. And um, you, you, you'll get this. It, just reading in English, you'll be fine in Micah chapter 1. I'm going to be reading from my older version of NIV here. Verse 8. So what we already said, by the way, in the beginning of the chapter, you know, chapter 1, verse 2, Hear, O peoples, all of you, listen, earth, all who are in it. Sovereign Lord, may witness against you. The Lord was holy. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes and treads the high places. The mountains melt beneath him. The valley split like wax before fire, like water rushing. All this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the house of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble. See, I'm coming with destruction, right? Now, verse 8. Because of this, Micah says, I will weep and wail. I will go about barefoot and naked. I'll howl like a jackal and moan like an owl, because all this destruction from God, well deserved. For her wound is incurable. It's come to Judah. It's reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. This is so bad. All this destruction coming that, that uh, Micah cries out, Tell it not in Gath. Weep not at all. Well, Gath is its a play on words in Hebrew. It's tell town. He's, you know, don't say it. Don't say it in Gath. But it is, the name of the city is tell it. And weep not at all. And it's Akko is a weeping town. And then in Beth Ophrah, roll in the dust. Well, Ophrah is a Hebrew word for dust town. Pass on in nakedness and shame, you who live in Shafir. Well, that, that's an actual city, but Shafir means beautiful town. Now you're rolling in dust in Shafir. Right? Those who live in Za'anan will, will not come out. Za'anan means exit town. And Beth Azel is in mourning. Well, Beth Azel means neighbor town. Its protection is taken from those who live in Maroth, writhe in pain. Maroth means bitter town. See, he's playing on words of these actual cities and, and this proclamation of this sad scene of the judgment of God coming on all these towns and cities. It's just, to me, fascinating. That's how Micah writes. Another example I'll give you real quickly, and we'll wrap it up. Can you go to the chapter 5, this famous chapter? You'll recognize this right away in chapter 5.
chapter 5. So, marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel, the siege people, you know, surrounding us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But then I'll go on. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, although you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. You know that passage of the Christmas account, right? Yeah. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. But I'm going to go back to verse 1. So here's a prediction. That troops are going to surround Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. And they will, they will grab the king. Now what does the king hold in his hand, right? The king is holding this stick. It's called a... A scepter, right? This ruler's stick. That's what that is, right? Well, the word in Hebrew, strike Israel's ruler, the word for ruler in Hebrew is shofet. Shofet. The word in Hebrew for the stick is shavet. It has the same consonants but different vowels. So you're going to strike the shofet with the shavet. This is, how, this is how Micah writes. He uses a play on words. And the, and the consonants are the same, but the vowels are different. And if you're reading it in Hebrew, you kind of chuckle because he goes, well, how about that, you know? So the ruler is going to be hit by a ruler, you know, that, you know, like a ruler, like a big thing, like, like your teacher comes by and slaps you, right? That's kind of what the would be. The ruler gets hit with a ruler. I mean, that's kind of how Micah is writing. Not kind of, that's how he write. But it's it's not just chapter 1 when he's talking about destruction on certain towns and using town names. That, But it's throughout the book. He's got this. In fact, if you go to, now I can do one more. Chapter 7 at the end, at the end of Micah. And then after all this uh, mixing of judgment, and now he's got these promises like Amos wrapping it up. So chapter 7, 18, verse 18 at the end. Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You don't stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities to the depths of the sea. And can you find anything in the Bible more beautiful than that? I mean, that's just... But how about this? He starts off the sentence, Who is a God like you? The Hebrew word for who is me. And like is <laughs> and if you say like you, you say ha, ha, mi, ha. Who is a God like you? Mi, ha. What's his name? Micah. His name is who is like you? Mi, ha. <laughs> it's just Really, the, the, this paranoia, this that's the technical word for playing it with words, playing a play on words. It's not like a pun, like trying to make you laugh, but it's this unique use of language to be very, I think, dramatic and gorgeous and beautiful in conveying the love of God. Who is like, who is Micha? And it's, it's, it's his name. Who is like you? Micha. <laughs> who pardons sins and you know, hurls our, our sins into the depths of the sea, who tramples our sins. Who is like you? But nobody's like you because you're God. You know, this is just so gorgeous. And that's Micah. And you'll get it in English. I mean, it's just, but when you read it in Hebrew, it's like, oh my goodness, it's just so, so fun. <laughs> so there, there is, I went to my time up now. And even the heat went off. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>